Lord, we thank you that the testimony of the psalmist continues to direct our attention and affection for the scriptures. Uh, just even as we were uh, addressing this last Wednesday night, it can can feel like there's a bit of redundancy. We, we're, we've advanced 144 verses through one chapter in the Psalms, and it has such a, a strong uh, emphasis on the Word of God, and it expresses it in such diversity. And somebody might think, well, how can you uh, maintain that kind of emphasis with that uh, that range of verses and the the nature of the poetic structure? Is it just a, is it just a exasperating a subject? No, he's reminding us over and over and over again of the preciousness and the high value of your word. Um, the 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 vantage point of those who are themselves righteous. They're going to pursue a God who is righteous and whose word is righteous and endures forever. And so we thank you for. Um, the testimony provided. We thank you that it, it is very much like uh, the, the discipline of exercise and developing muscle memory. We're hearing and, and participating over and over again in prayer and worshipful thought and meditation on the magnificence of the Word of God. And so uh, help us that that would take root. And that as we uh, give particular attention to things like the discipline of hermeneutics or the, uh, the subject of the deity of Christ and the challenges that are uh, poised against it, or the the study of the book of James, that we would always remember that we we draw these truths from the revealed Word of God, and that um, you've generously provided that for us. Uh, so many people want to hear hear from God; they want they want some message, and you've provided a very clear message, and you've made it sufficient, and and uh, it's uh, one that impacts the totality of our life and transforms us. And so we thank you for your Word. Thank you that again that testifies of you, um, that we can, again, as the psalmist testified, affirm that you are righteous and that your word is righteous. We ask that you would um, help us now also as we, we've we gathered for, for uh, a good purpose. We, we didn't just all come together because we saw other people kind of congregating. And we came together to, to invest in one another's life, to, to fellowship, to encourage one another, to strengthen one another, to spend time in prayer, to, to do that which we... Um, are charged and expected to do in the privacy of our own homes and lives. We do that together, uh, but also we do things that we can't do to, uh, as individuals, and that's to fellowship and invest in one another and to speak one another's life and and not only um, receive updates. Uh, there's there's no shortage of abundance with things like social media. People want to share everything. They want to tell what they're eating and what they're looking like, and there's a perhaps a peculiar interest in that, but there's a there's a sweetness to the fellowship that we have here and the sense of uh, investing in life, uh, genuinely investing in life and the nurturing and, and care for one another. And then we do center ourselves on the reading and studying of the scriptures uh, that we might better know you, not so that we can just be better students, but that we could fulfill the charge that you gave uh, the disciples as they uh, congregated around uh, the, the resurrected Lord and you charged them to make disciples and to, to baptize and to, to see uh, people brought to full maturity in Christ. And that's our aim. That's our objective. We want to be faithful disciples and make disciples. And so we do things like labor for uh, long periods of time in small portions of Scripture, not just to, to wax eloquent or just to uh, provide some interesting um, speech or oratory experience, but to, to better know and love your word and to be transformed by it. And so we ask that you'd be our help in this process, that we would see and hear and think clearly. Help me to communicate faithfully. Um, I've fulfilled the, as best I can the, the part of my charge to prepare. Now help me to, to execute by expressing it as the very words of God and to do so in a way that is helpful to those who hear. And for those who are here and who may hear it some other context uh, because they're away because of providential circumstances or just other other um, opportunities we ask that uh, we would all hear in a way that we receive and are um, impacted by your word. So we ask that you'd be our help. You are a teacher. Would you, as the psalmist has prayed, open our eyes. Would you be one to make things plain? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this morning, we're going to begin our study of the book of James, which in some ways advances a, a clear thread of work for me. Um, but before we really get into that, I need to, to speak to the fact that uh, for our guests, there's, there's always a qualification when you have guests. It's sometimes it's, well, we usually do it this way, or sorry about that. Usually I have an audiovisual problem. That may come. But 
And sometimes we, we're like, well, we usually cover more than maybe two or three verses. Well, today I have to qualify, um, and Isaiah helped draw this to my attention. We will cover more than one word usually because the, the book of James begins as James, and that's as far as we're going. We're going to talk a lot about James, but for good reason. But the, also, I want to draw to your attention that, again, this is a, there's a sweetness to this study and this discipline because there's a, there's a clear thread of study for me personally, and I'd like to just share that for a moment. So the first message that I preached as, as one of the pastors of Grace Bible Church, it had already been constituted, y'all have been faithful, um, came alongside, and it was in January of 2020 that I gave my very first message, and it was from 1 Peter chapter 5. There's a very specific reason for that, but I'd like to draw that to your attention for a moment. 1 Peter chapter 5, and uh, reads 1 through 4. Oh, there we go. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, overseeing not under compulsion, but willingly, according to God, and not for dishonest gain, but with eagerness nor yet as lording it over those allotted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, I chose that text all the way back to January 2020 because I wanted to establish a very clear foundation to this church regarding how I understand the charge to participate in the work of Shepherd in Christ's church. It's not my church any more than it's Frank's church or that it's Matt's church. It's Christ's church, and he alone is the chief shepherd to whom the three of us will answer and for whom we look to for our reward. So that was a foundational charge I wanted to provide. Then that spring, we worked through the dual dynamics of being locked down and displaced from the school where we had just begun meeting. I had persuaded, let's meet at a school. That'd be helpful. And then COVID happened, and then the school put us out, and it wasn't as helpful as I thought it might be. And so we met remotely, and we gave, um, and then through that opportunity, I chose to give some special messages on Peter's resurrection testimony, uh, his resurrection testimony. And as we, be, as we migrated our fellowship to the pastor's driveway, I began teaching um, through 1 Peter, which was completed here in the building. And then what's naturally followed after 1 Peter, you go to 2 Peter. And then when we finished our study in the book of 2 Peter, we began the book of Jude. Jude, who's, uh, uh, um, that was what, this last March. And it was a choice rooted in um, Jude's thematically picking up where Peter had left off. So Peter talked about there is a, an imminent threat to the church. Um, it's coming. And then Jude says, it's come, folks. It's here. And so we picked up that thematic development from the book of Jude. And uh, now we've come to James. And he continues in a different way. He continues this thread, as it were, Peter to Jude having a thematic connection, Jude to James having a familial connection. And many of you will follow what I mean by that is Jude was the half-brother of Jesus, but opens his letter recognizing that this familiar relationship to Jesus has changed. And so you see there in Jude chapter 1, Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ, he doesn't say Jude the half-brother, but a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So Jesus was no longer framed with a, a view to being his half-brother, but his Lord. However, Jude did highlight a different family tie, and that was to his brother, James, the writer of the book of James, to which we'll be giving our attention. So 1 Peter, 2 Peter, Jude, now to James. And some of you may be curious, that's interesting, but why is he escorting me on a journey down the path of past studies? If he keeps doing this over the years, this is going to be a really long introduction for every book. Well, maybe because of peculiar sentimentality. I have that in some degree, and I like the little icons I created. Maybe that's it, or the fact that there's coincidences in terms of the patterns of subsequent studies. Well, then maybe that's part of it. But I've enjoyed the unanticipated thread of studies, and it may very well continue over the span of three years, but there's more to giving to such, a, or such attention to such matters. First, I drew attention to the desire that I had um, to, to preach my first message here from a passage that might highlight and draw pastoral convictions. That's very important because I see James doing the same thing. And James was a pastor. He's a pastor actually of the church of Jerusalem and one who was present from the very inception of the church. So I could share that, you know, I came in a few, about a year and a half or two years into the, in the Constitution of Grace Bible Church, but James could say, I was there from the very beginning. And he established some things at the very beginning that spoke to 
his philosophy of ministry, his theology, and how he's going to impact things in the letter as well. That, it's all impacted by where he was, when he was. So he was there from the very inception of the church. He participated in its shepherding care through its earliest years of both joys and struggles. And James wrote this letter, again, as a pastor to members of Christ's flock, that they might draw from the wisdom that comes from above, walk a righteous path, and through works and struggles, see their faith perfected. Now, I'm going to repeat that, not just because it makes my icon make sense now, but because I hope that you'll see, not only through today, but through the course of our study, that that's what I believe James is driving at. I hope that that continues to, to make itself plain, but I, I want to repeat that um, because, again, it reflects the core of what he's driving at. So let me put that up here for you. So James wrote this letter as a pastor to members of Christ's flock so that they might draw from the wisdom that comes from above, walk a righteous path, and, work, and through works and struggles see their faith perfected. And don't worry about that word perfected and think, oh no, this is a, a sinless perfectionism, or he's saying something that the other authors of the New Testament didn't write. Don't worry, we'll clarify that next week. So if you make it through this week and um, you're able to, to return next week, the matter of perfection and completion and maturity is one of the driving themes of the book. But again, that'll be next week. Second, whereas I could make a clear line of association between Peter's letters and Jude's letter, with James, I can make a clear association to Jesus' teaching. So I was able to say, look at this connection, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, Jude, now to James, James could say, watch this connection, James to Jesus. And so it's a very fascinating connection here. So I can make associations, James most certainly could, specifically the teachings of Jesus, Sermon on the Mount in particular. So to Peter's early ministry, um, there's also connections to Peter's early ministry in the church, and even to Paul's developing theology and challenged convictions, and much more, all in this small letter. And... That being said, while it has connections, it's also very different. It's a very different epistle, which was also the first gift of its kind to the church, as it was the earliest letter to the New Testament church. So it does all kinds of fascinating connections. When you're the first, you're going to set a tone. When you're the first, you're going to speak to different things. And when you write in the early church and other things are happening in the early church, guess what? It impacts what you said. It impacts how you ought to think about those other letters. And so his influence and impact won't be just, oh, that's neat. First Peter, second Peter, Jude, James. It's no James to Jesus, James to Peter, James to Paul, James to the foundations of the early church in such a way that you start looking, be like, you look, it's like you're looking at a picture like, James is there. I didn't realize that. And then you flip the page and you're looking at early church pictures and you're reminiscing. You're like, James is there. And then you start looking at the history like, James had a hand in that. It's fascinating connections that I hope will be made plain to us as we walk through this and help us understand the book. Now, in part because of the early nature of the book, though, and with the historical context of the letters, some people have found James' uh, content lacking, which is a little frustrating. I, I've taken up defense for Peter. I'm going to do it for James as well. They found his content lacking or desired even necessary substance. Well, in what way? Well, they're bothered that Christ is only mentioned twice in the entire epistle. And with one of these references, the opening greeting and identification of the author, he just says, James, a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Other references to the Lord may intend to direct our attention to Christ, but they well could be to God the Father as well. And so there are some challenges. And to compound this frustration, for some are the references to various persons from redemptive history. And you think, well, that's really rude to be upset that James references other people in redemptive history and that people say, well, I don't like that. Well, they don't like it for a very specific reason, because he'll talk about things like uh, certain persons by name and specifically the prophets in a context of examples and suffering and exercising patience. Things that we would expect to be associated with Christ, but he references the prophets. No such references to Christ as you would expect in other epistles. Therefore, it's hard for some to reconcile this, especially when their philosophy of preaching is that you always make a beeline to the cross, or that a New Testament preacher ought not to be content to preach a message that could only or that could that could never be preached in a Jewish synagogue. Well, the irony here is that um, James actually uses the term synagogue when referencing these believers coming together. So he says, when you gather together, and the term is when you synagogue, when you're in the synagogue. 
But that aside, I'll wholly understand why so many hold these convic uh, convictions and with a, a reasonable measure of tension as well. Because James's content or apparent lack of content when it comes to preaching Christ can be distressing. You wonder, well, why doesn't he say more? Because preaching Christ is what we do, right? That's part of our charge. If, if every week we didn't mention, and if it became a pattern, you might start to say, well, why aren't they saying anything more about that? We're a Christian church, Christ's church. Why aren't they saying more? That, that would be reasonable grounds to start being concerned if it became a pattern or maybe a whole exhaustive study about something and no reference to the Lord. Because again, preaching Christ is what we do. And Paul emphatically expressed this both in practice and in written word. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 to 24, where he writes, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. So again, yeah, we preach Christ crucified. Exactly, we do. To Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. However, James had no less, and don't you forget this, he had no less of an esteem and conviction for declaring the finished work of Christ than anyone else. Don't take that away from James. You have to understand why and what he wrote. But he also had no special duty to state all things at all times in all contexts. He did not have a responsibility to unpack his full Christology in this letter. He's writing to believers with a purpose in mind, and with this, we need to be careful not to minimize the weight and value of what he does express. So if you're always worried about, he doesn't say this, you're missing on what he does say. And that's a tragedy. But we also have to remember that we're reading James. We're reading James. We're not reading Peter. Don't say he doesn't sound like Peter. Well, of course he doesn't. He's James. And don't think, well, he doesn't sound like John. Well, he doesn't because he's not John. And well, well, Paul would have done this. Well, exactly. But he's not Paul. And that's okay. And I think that distinction is often forgotten. And when it is, then something else is forgotten too, that James was a distinguished leader of the New Testament church. And whereas Peter is often esteemed for his unique leadership roles among the apostles during Jesus' public ministry and later the early church in its formative moments, and Paul, oh goodness, Paul, the esteemed great missionary theologian who provided the New Testament church many of its rich range of doctrines and, and practices and structures. Well, James is almost all but forgotten. And then you start to wonder, well, who is this guy? He doesn't sound like the others. And then he's occasionally pulled out of the closet and dusted off when someone wants to provide a good charge for others. You know, be doers of the word, not just hearers. You're like, where'd that come from, Paul? No, it came from James. Oh, yeah, that guy. Or when someone's trying to find a clear proof text for healing and prayer. Let's go to James chapter 5, where the elders come, they anoint with oil. Or perhaps most commonly, when there's an appetite for an apparent controversy over faith and works, uh, we're going to get James out, and we're going to say, oh, he and Paul, oh, boy, they're in tension. And James and Paul would be like, what are you talking about? They would be like, they would look at the comment sections on Facebook and be like, seriously, folks? You missed it. You missed it. We're not in controversy here. But this would be quite surprising, again, to see James in these ways, to just occasionally reference him or, or just occasionally pull him out for different special occasions. It'd be surprising to not only James, though, but both James and Peter and Paul who, as we'll see in our work of introducing this book, clearly regarded James as one of the early church's most consequential leaders. This was a man that both Peter and Paul gave deference to in leadership. They didn't say, yeah, James is one of us. They deferred to James. And they deferred to him in theology and even common counsel. And as we'll see in his introduction, while he does not really have much to say of himself, it's probably because he didn't have to. You know, we were talking last night, and some people... They, they make silly statements like I overqualify things, and I can explain why in just a moment. But uh, James didn't have to do that, did he? You know, we run into people sometimes, and um, boy, especially when you operate like we do with a plurality of elders, and you start to explain things and say like, hi, my name's David, what do you do? I'm one of the pastors at such and such. Well, you know, so we do this thing together, and it's like, well, I thought there was just one, and there's a pecking order. It's just, and then you try to explain, it's just, stop. James didn't have to do that, did he? He didn't have to overqualify. Well, see, James, I'm the pastor in Jerusalem. I'm a church leader. You know, pretty consequential. James and or Peter and Paul and others listen to me. He doesn't have to do that. He can just say, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he spoke, 
And when he wrote, the church knew who he was. And the church listened. Peter listened. He doesn't sound like Peter. Well, Peter listened to him. Paul listened. He doesn't sound like Paul. Paul listened to him. And we would be wise to listen too. And this is why I'm persuaded that we are beginning really a most wonderful expedition in drawing out precious treasures that have been appreciated as valuable in a general matter. Like, oh, he isn't James nice, but I hope we'll be seen to be valuable in a magnificent matter. This is a very different book, and that's good for us. Because, again, James is different. Again, he did not write like others in the New Testament in style or content. And as I'm trying to continue to pound before you, this is to the frustration of some especially because you will only see Christ overtly mentioned twice in this book. But if you listen, and you really do have to listen as you read James and as you hear James, you will hear Christ. You will hear Christ proportionately more than anywhere outside of the Gospels. You'll start to say, well, some of you, if you teach enough or read enough or listen to enough and you hang around that person, they start sounding like them. Some of you, especially the little ones, will be cursed with this. You will sound like me and Frank and Matt. <laughs> I've watched it happen to me. I've watched it happen to others. You just start picking up on tone and inflection and emphasis. Well, if you listen to James more than any other New Testament author, you will hear Jesus. And it's extraordinary that a man who rejected Jesus' identity as the Christ throughout his public ministry sounds like one who functionally memorized his teachings. So, again, if you're looking for Paul or Peter or John in this letter by way of style or content, then you will be woefully disappointed and perhaps even confused. But do not make the same mistakes that many, many others have done. Your disappointment is not with James, or it's not James's fault. If you're frustrated, why does James say that? Why doesn't James say this? That's, that's not James's problem. That's, that's your problem. So we need to recognize that. He's different. He wrote in a very different time, in a very different context, for a very different reason than everyone else in the New Testament. Now, because James is different, because he only wrote this one book of the New Testament, um, and if we don't count his contribution to the Jerusalem Council when he happened to write one of the most consequential letters inside of a letter or inside of a book, then we have some other uh, Because of that, because of the, the limited material, you know, Peter, we follow him throughout the, the Gospels. And Paul, we follow his historical narrative. And then we have lots of letters. John, we follow him in the Gospels. And then we have lots of material. James doesn't make very many Gospel appearances, and those aren't particularly flattering. And then he wrote one letter, and he's mentioned a few times, well, several times throughout Acts, but not really highlighted in the way that we're appreciating Peter and Paul. And so when we, we come to him, there's some range of challenges. Because, again, we're operating off of more limited material. And these challenges range from authorship, which James? There's a lot of Jameses, um, popular name, to audience. Who did he write to? What are these dispersed tribes? Well, that's next week. To themes and structure. Again, major challenges there. Uh, I think maybe one of the cruelest things I did as a, as a teacher of teachers was I, I required some children's workers to outline the book of James. And I was very naive at the time. I thought, that's an expected normal discipline when you're teaching a book. And then if you read an introduction to the book of James or background to the book of James, they will say you'll have the range of you can't outline this book to it's impossible to outline this book to it's really hard to outline this book to here's my outline and it looks different than everybody else's. But it works. And I'm going to argue next week that there is a very clear intentional structure to James. Uh, people say, well, it's a pearl necklace that's been taken off the string. No, it's a pearl necklace that's magnificently framed together. You just got to do some work to get there. And we're going to do that next week. So... Just come well-rested and caffeinated, and we'll have it cooler in here. <laughs> but again, these challenges, they're, they're, they're wide. Authorship, audience, theme, structure. So we're going to take a little bit more time than we might for another book of its size in providing its introduction. But bear in mind, introductions are invaluable as they frame the whole of the book, provide the larger context, and give us direction in our forthcoming study. So our plan for the remainder of our time today will only be to introduce James the man and pillar within the New Testament church. And then next week, we're going to begin our work in examining the book's major themes, its structure, and establishes audience and related historical matters. So this may be part one of two. It may be part one of something. I don't know yet, but we'll get there. So today will be more of a historical examination of the person of James, and next week more the formal elements of introducing the book itself. Again, not the common pattern of introduction for me, but um, as I was, I was sharing with Denise when I was working through the decision to effectively do a, a concise character study of James, that's really kind of what it comes down to, um, the book's author, I can't think of a better place to speak to his person, to James, his work and his life. 
because I'm going to continue to emphasize this, and I want you to get it, he had such a unique and extraordinary role in, t- uh, in terms of this time and place in the New Testament church and the history of the early church, but it's almost in such a way that he's the, the character that he's carrying so much of the weight of a, of a matter, but you only realize just how much when you carefully, you got to watch the credits, and you just got to keep watching and be like, there's James. Oh, there he is again and again and again. He was right there doing something amazing, but we usually miss him along the way. And so it's in the range of these details that we also begin to more clearly see the book. So it's not just, well, I'm trying to redeem a, a, an appreciation of James. I do want to do that. But what you'll see is if we have the right James, and we do, then so much of his history, so much of his character, so much of what he did and said in the book of Acts and in other places impact how we understand the letter of James, which would be so helpful when we get to some sticky spots and we're like, I don't understand. That's okay, because we draw back from the history and say, ah, that makes sense now. There was a time and a place and a reason, and other people interacted with it. So it's in the range of these details that we also begin to more clearly again see that book that he wrote as we go on to give much attention to the, the details, the contents of the week ahead. So that being said, as we begin our introduction to James, the author of this book, we have to concede that we are operating with a, with a firm but not an absolute measure of confidence um, regarding which among a number of potential Jameses wrote the letter. And that might sound kind of weird to you, but then you look at the list of the apostles and you have two Jameses in the twelve. Okay, wow, that's, that's a high ratio of Jameses. And then you have another guy that was the son of James, and you're like, well, that didn't help the situation. Why do they even throw that in there? And then you have James, the brother of Jesus, and you probably have a few other Jameses peppered around. It's like the, the I guess, the Bob and Bill and Smith of the New Testament in some ways, or the Judases and Judes. It's a very common name, but it's a good name. It's a very good New Testament name, but you have a lot of them. And so we need to realize or recognize which James wrote the book. Because I can sign something, David, there's a certain context, people will understand that David. I can sign David, and then I could be at a conference, and they'd be like, which one of you? Um, we have a friend, David Smith. Um, there's a David Smith conference, apparently, or congregation or something. Apparently, it's such a common name that they all get together, or they can. Um, there's other David Crows out there. Um, I take credit for very few of them from what I know about them. And I apologize <laughs> to the other good David Crows. But nevertheless, who wrote this letter? Who is this James? And this was a matter that I'd originally planned to speak of in the language of the different thresholds for criminal and civil court cases, namely the standards of beyond reasonable doubt and the standard of the preponderance of evidence. So the higher of those standards being the first, that a conclusion can be reached without a reasonable challenge or doubt. The second is effectively a tipping of the scales to one side or the other. And I was initially going to argue that we have the preponderance of evidence that James the Just, otherwise known as James the brother of Jude and half-brother of Jesus, wrote the letter. I was going to say that after looking at all these things, it leans that way. But after spending much time on this and examining the range of evidence, I'm prepared to express that we can state beyond a reasonable doubt that it was indeed James the Just who wrote this book. It's not just that the scales tip this way. Now, they flop over. We know what James it was, and if you want some more help on that, there's a lot of material that you can wrestle with and we can walk through together. But I'm persuaded that we can meet this higher standard regarding this conviction about the identity of James, a conclusion that does not purport to be absolutely free of challenge or doubt. You may look in your study Bible footnotes and they say, we're not really sure. I'm not saying that it's lock solid. I'm saying we have incredible strength of evidence to say this was James the Just. It's a reasonable conclusion given the evidence. Now, does that really matter? Yes. Boy, I hope you end today and you think, if we got the James wrong, then I don't know that we'll ever understand this book. It does matter. Now, it doesn't matter in some ways. Maybe the challenges to authorship in other books are more significant in the sense that sometimes Peter's authorship is challenged for liberal purposes. You know, he had a, somebody wrote under the name of Peter, and they wrote 100 years later. There's challenges to authorship where people are just trying to, to assault the scriptures. This is not that kind. It's just which James. And the only other really strong candidate would be James, the son of Zebedee. James and John, sons of thunder, son, um, so very, you know, one of the closest of Jesus' inner circle. That's a really good candidate. However, my conclusion that this is James the Just also has the overwhelming support of conservative evangelicalism scholars, teachers, and pastors. That doesn't mean anything in some ways, but it does in others. 
And I would also concede everyone's not settled here. Not everyone settled here. Not because of some liberal bent by some people even out of, or some duty out of scholarship, but because the weighing of the evidence is challenging sometimes. So I don't want you to walk away and be like, it's not hard. It was hard. And it's hard for other people. And truthfully, I found that most persons arguing against James, the son of Zebedee, I think they kind of have a, a deficient um, argument, as it were. And I don't say that to be proud or arrogant. They are really excellent scholars. I just don't think they put their best work forward, especially when they are centered on his martyrdom coming too early. And that's the most common reason. It's not James, the son of Zebedee. He got killed too early. But then we go on to say, this letter is an early letter. Why not a little bit earlier? Because we date it the year after James, the son of Zebedee, was dead. Why not the year before? I think that's a deficient argument to say that that's why he's not. But if that's our best argument, mm, maybe we need to keep working at it. But I think um, there are a lot better evidences out there. I think that it fills itself out. I think the New Testament evidence, I think extra biblical material evidence, it's very, very, very clear. But I don't want you to see a weak argument and be like, wow, now I'm not sure. It's okay. And we have a really great candidate as a backup. But again, my confidence doesn't rely so much on the exclusion of another James, but I do factor it in with the solid evidence for James the just, as we'll refer to him every so often. <coughs> and in fairness to the challenging nature of this matter, I do want to include one quote, William Barclay. And you, you know, don't look from up on the screen because I don't want this to be uh, burned into your minds and imaginations. I just want you to be aware of it. Because it's a conclusion that I charitably disagree with, but respect for its struggle to be faithful and not just joining the wave of opinion among friends. Because that's a danger even with scholarship. Well, everybody else is saying this. It's hard. And we're going to get past this, but I want you to hear this quote for a moment. He states, The evidence for and against James's authorship of this letter is extraordinarily evenly balanced. For the moment, we must leave the matter unresolved and turn to certain other questions. So it's even those who struggle would say it's balanced. I'd say it's more than balanced. So at the least, we have a clear tipping of the scales for our conclusion. And the next best candidate was one of Jesus' closest apostles who ruled and was ruled out by many because he was martyred so early. But we can do better. We can do better in our scholarship than that, as the evidence in favor of James the Just is substantial. And this matters because it shapes how we understand this author including how and what he wrote and the nature of his relationship to Christ church and its foundational leadership to include such men as Peter and Paul. So we're going to get to a text now um, with the understanding that the book of James was written by James the just, the half brother of Jesus. We can trace a most fascinating history of him through the gospels and through much of the book of Acts. Now, with that being said, we're introduced to James in the gospels first. Uh, just by way of identifying him as a brother of Jesus. And then he's reintroduced in a rather unflattering way as one who rejected the testimony of Jesus. So first, in Matthew 13, and I know that's very small. It's, we just had to make room for things, and it's a, hopefully an enduring resource if you want to keep it in some other way. But first we meet him in Matthew 13, and we see that he's named among Jesus' brothers. We read, is not this the carpenter's son, talking about Jesus, is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Now, if you're interested in just complete sidebars, there is an abundance of material on how to understand that statement, Jesus' brothers. Were they cousins? Were they relatives? Were they friends? No, they were his brothers. And among those brothers, the first name is James. And as you recall, the Judas reference here was Jude, whose letter we just finished studying a number of weeks ago. James and Jude, or James and Judas. But then we have a most unfortunate follow-up engagement with James that speaks to his relationship to Jesus during the years of Jesus' public ministry. And after these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea, because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. Therefore his brothers, which would include James, said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works, which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when, he's, when he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself publicly to the world. And then the commentary is, for not even his brothers, to include James and Jude, were believing in him. However, James' story magnificently changes. And this is extraordinary and so gracious and so precious to us. It magnificently changes following Christ's resurrection. We see this as Paul recounts in 1 Corinthians 15, those who were personally encountered by Christ after his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8. 
Paul states, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, also known as Peter, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. After that, Jesus appeared to James. Which James? James the just, James the brother of Jesus, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as the one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Look at that text. Only three persons out of 500 plus witnesses are named or directly referenced. Cephas or Peter, James, and then Paul who talks about his own testimony. That is extraordinary company to be named among. And as we'll see, both Peter and Paul would say the same of their being named with James. So we first note that Jesus engaged his half-brother, James, following his resurrection, a man that it was rumored people would, have, would come to see in person to get an idea of what Jesus looked like. So again, pure speculation, pure rumor, but it was, what did Jesus look like? We don't have pictures, we don't have little uh, images or paintings. It's pure rumor and probably nothing but speculative rumor. But I include that pure embellishment for one reason, I, again, I think it's rumored speculations, but I knew it might awaken something in you in that moment. Like, wait a second. Why would that even be a rumor that could have standing? Because this was Jesus' brother. You see that relationship? I don't want you to miss that and be like, oh, yeah, he's another guy. That was James. He was really the half-brother of Jesus himself. And we have to qualify half-brother because Jesus was virgin-born and didn't share a biological father with anyone. But there was a familial connection between these two men. James was his brother. And James, who was raised not only in the same town, but the same home as Jesus, heard and saw his testimony, heard and saw his teachings, heard and saw his works, and yet rejected Jesus as Messiah. That is, until he was publicly crucified, buried, and raised. Now, might James have believed before the resurrection? I personally don't think so. And not when Jesus looks down from the cross and entrusts the care of their mother, James's and Jesus' mother, to John, the disciple who was beloved but also believing. So what a kindness. And again, what an amazing kindness and what a shaping kindness. We're familiar with Paul's testimony. We read it two, three times in Acts and other places. And we know why is that important? Because it shaped him. It formed him. It informs our understanding of him. So what a kindness that James was among the relatively few people who saw, who heard, and who touched the resurrected Christ. And think about that, because I'm not sure that we can really appreciate the fact that Jesus went to his brother. He went to his brother personally, delivering him from his unbelief. So you have the resurrected Christ, not here for many days, not engaging many people, as we saw in the life of Christ. It's, it's here and then moves, here and moves. But who does he prioritize and choose to go to? He goes to his brother, who brother who's denied him all throughout his public testimony, all throughout his public ministry, and he reveals himself, and James the just, James the brother of Jesus, is now believing. That, to me, is an extraordinary testimony. It's not Paul falling off the horse and seeing the resurrected Christ in that way. It is James meeting his brother, who's no longer regarded as brother, but as his Lord. To me, that's amazing. And that shapes how you should understand James and his, how he thinks about his Christology. Don't knock his Christology as though he didn't understand these things. Again, it undoubtedly shaped him. And I'm going to take up a measure of offense for James because I do get frustrated when people express their, well, his Christology is really weak. Boy, he intimately knew the man who yielded his life as an atoning sacrifice, was buried and raised, and after being raised, personally engaged him better than probably most other people. His Christology was probably more well-rounded and extraordinary. So I'm convinced that James would have more to say again about Christology than could fill our innumerable books so when he said what he did, I think we'd be wise to listen and not to be like, well, he didn't say this. Well, what he did say was intimately informed by what he did know. Now, what is also interesting here is that, as I mentioned earlier, James sounds more like Jesus in his teaching than any other New Testament author, a matter that many persons have highlighted 
and it's well expressed by D. N. D. Edmund uh, Hebert and many others. I have a chart up here. Um, I give a citation of the chart. You can find a dozen different expressions of this. I think it's helpful, the connections between James's teaching and the Sermon on the Mount, but this is what uh, Hebert said about this connection. The epistle offers a larger number of similarities to the Sermon on the Mount than, any, or than another book in the New Testament. If the Apostle Paul developed the significance of the death of Jesus, it may be said that James developed the teaching of Jesus. They had a different role and function. And yet we have to keep in mind that James did not personally follow Jesus during his public ministry. So where might he have developed this, this fluency in Jesus' teaching, particularly matters spoken to in the Sermon on the Mount? Well, there, there is the possibility that he was exposed to Jesus' teaching even while persisting in unbelief. But what is more likely and consistent with how James expresses these similarities is that he was a student of the oral preservation of the teachings of Jesus and went on to take ownership of their truths for himself. And, and that's an observation that contributes to the larger argument for the early dating of the letter between A.D. 44 and 62 as the gospel accounts as we have them in written form would not have been available to him. And so he's a student of the oral accounts. He's a student of the, the apostles' teaching and he becomes a master student of the words of his brother and Lord and expresses them in his own teaching. Now, returning to James's historic references, we know he was actively around as Jesus, is pub uh, as Jesus publicly ministered, but he re rejected Jesus as Messiah until after the resurrection and Christ himself engaged his brother. And following, though, his post-resurrection appearances, Christ ascended to heaven, and the core of the believing community was then gathered together in the upper room in Jerusalem. Guess who would have been in that crowd? Among others, this group would have included the apostles, Mary the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. His brothers, which would naturally include his oldest and, or the oldest of his siblings, in terms of younger siblings, and the most obvious would be the one that they got named as believing. It would include James. And we see this in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. He's not named here, but he's there. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount, of, called, Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James, the other James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, there's another James, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, there's another James. These all with one accord were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. We give him credit in the Gospels for being among the unbelieving. We have to give him credit here for the believing, especially in, in light of 1 Corinthians 15. This means that James, the half-brother of Jesus, was gathered with the nucleus of believers that would go on to receive the Holy Spirit at the inauguration of Christ's church. He was there. He would have heard and participated in the worshipful declarations of praise to God in that moment and watched as Peter corrected the mockers before going on to deliver the church's first sermon, which would in turn provoke thousands to salvation and faith in the resurrected Christ. He was an eyewitness and participant to those things. Acts chapter 2. James would have been a vibrant and even leading participant in those moments of the early church that are so often esteemed as an ideal standard. Oh, we could get back to Acts chapter 2. Well, that's a really nice ideal, except none of us would be there because we're all Gentiles. Um, so nevertheless, uh, so often as an ideal standard that is longed for by so many today, an early church that consisted only of Jewish believers. And I want to qualify that because it's very important as you get to the letter of James, which was written to Jewish believers. And we read here in Acts chapter 2, And they, Jewish believers in Christ, were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were, gathered, were together, and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions, and were dividing them up with all, as anyone might have need. And, with daily, and, and daily, devoting themselves with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding Jewish believers to their number daily, those who were being saved. And again, you're like, why? Wow, you're overqualifying. It's because I want you to understand where we are in redemptive history, because we'll get some Gentiles in a little bit, but not yet, and not by the time that James was written. And so James's experiences with the early church would have continued. He was there at Pentecost. He was there in the precious 
foundational moments. He watched, he saw, and he watched and participated in its maturing through testing and struggles. One form of early testing of the church came with a question of how would it handle disputed care of various widows and persons in need. And if you're familiar with James or have been reading in preparation for our study, then I hope something comes to mind when you hear of, an early, of this early challenge for the church. How will they care for the widows? Well, maybe James is watching and learning and listening, and now he'll go on to speak of it himself. This is pure and undefiled religion, that you take care of widows and orphans. In James chapter 1, verse 27, because in these moments, James was observing how the apostles would lead Christ's church in pure and undefiled religion through this moment of tension and resolution and care. And I want you to see these things shaped his person and his book. And then, not much later, within the first two to three years of the church's inauguration of Pentecost, James would have observed, observed the providential scattering of many of the believers from Jerusalem. We read Acts very quickly. It's almost like one day this happened, the next day this happened. It was two to three years later that we come to Acts chapter 8. And he would have observed this. He would have been there. He would have been a participant, and not only a passive observant. So we have numerous Jewish men and women who had put their faith in Jesus, the resurrected Messiah, were now dispersed under the weight of persecution, of which Saul of Tarsus played no small role. James is there. He knows what's happening. He knows who the players are. And he's witnessing. He's observing. He was in Jerusalem. He's leading in Jerusalem. And you have to keep some very important details in mind here. We're up to Acts chapter 8 now, and the church is already a few years old and beginning to be scattered in its centering from Jerusalem. Does that contribute to his authorship and where he wrote? I think so. And the Jewish church at this time, again, at the church at this time, was very Jewish. These were Jewish believers, and they're being scattered. They're going out. Now, there were some unique responses among a select few persons outside of traditional Judaism. So you can say, oh, wait a second, I know that guy was proselytized. I know that they were unique exceptions, but the church was undisputably a Jewish church and remained so until Peter's divinely summoned engagement with Cornelius, as we read in Acts chapter 11. And we actually have the testimony of that in Acts chapter 11. It was a defining moment. It was before this, but it was a defining moment. Well, how defining was it? How big of a deal was it? Well, Peter has to go on to explain, like it happened to us, it happened to them. Something changed. So where are we? James, unbeliever. James, a mocker of Jesus. James encounters the resurrected Christ. He becomes James, a believer. James in the upper room. James at Pentecost. James in the church and watching and growing and participating. James watching them struggle. James seeing persecution. And now James will also be a witness to something magnificent happening among this whole different people group that hasn't happened in the entirety of the Judeo-Christian faith to that time. It was a defining moment in which you have the introduction of an uncircumcised Gentile convert with no Jewish affiliation receiving the Holy Spirit, just like the Jewish believers had at Pentecost. James saw that. He understood that. He was part of it. Approximately seven years before this time was Pentecost. So now we're advancing two years in persecution, or three years, seven years in, somewhere around that, you have Cornelius. But what is even more striking is this moment is that unlike the entire history of Judaism, a Gentile did not have to first convert to Judaism and submit to the law. Is that important? Absolutely, because every one of us here would also have to participate in becoming Jews so that we become Christians if it was the other way around, right? And you know who you can be grateful for for that? James. Well, and Peter, and the apostles, and the elders. But don't forget James. And don't forget the fact that, again, he's watching the New Testament church that we esteem, and it's precious, and it's intimate, and it's scattered, and it's struggling. Jews coming to Christ, Jews coming to Christ, Jews coming to Christ. Now something's changed, and it's very different. It's very different. And he sees that, and he sees that, wait a second, it's different. They're Gentiles, and they don't have to become proselytes. Something's changed. It was a mystery, as Paul wrote. But James is observing this, and James is participating in this process. And I know for some of us, or for all of us, really, 2,000 years later, we had the propensity to say, of course that wasn't necessary. Of course we didn't have to become Jews. The church is distinct. It is different. But when you're going almost a decade as a Jewish church, at this point in time, about seven plus years, this would have been a challenging learning curve. And James is right there as all this is unfolding. So how many of you have had habits and practices for seven years, and then all of a sudden everything changes? If we had, a, well, what we're 5, 13, 18, we're going on four years. We do this for three more years, and all of a sudden bam, something major changes, we'd be like, whoa, I don't know about that. That would take a lot of pastoral care, wouldn't it? To walk 
through major developments of theology and, and the development of the church, and James was there. And he's seeing that. And with James, he would, have, he would have known of Peter's testimony to these matters too. And he likely would have been involved with the discussion that centered on wrestling to understand God's plan of unfolding and the care of the, of the church through these transitional times. And I say that not of some wishful speculation. I want to see James everywhere. I kind of do, but, and it's not just to round out the character of James, but because just before this, before this was recorded, this occasion in Acts, we have in Acts chapter 9, it's believed that Paul, who was a tumult, he, he had a tumultuous start to ministry. So, you know, some guys, they, they really struggle to get their, their legs under them in terms of ministry and practice. And you look at Paul, and boy, he preached Christ, and boy, did he get people excited. And he got run out of town, and he got, the church was disrupted, and he'd go away, and then Luke says, and then there was peace. Um, it was interesting. He had a very tumultuous start. And the Lord providentially sent him off to Arabia for three years, where he was supernaturally discipled. Then he makes a trip to Jerusalem. That's believed, um, and I have to lean on others with this, um, it's believed to have happened in Acts chapter 9. So this is before chapter 11. So we're backing up for just a moment. And Paul came to faith. He's discipled by the Lord in Arabia for three years. And then he makes a visit to Jerusalem. What's that matter? Well, let's see who he goes to visit. Where he has limited his visit to two men, Peter and James, the Lord's brother. That's the testimony of Paul. It's not, well, this James, that James. We read this in Galatians 1, 18 to 19. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. But, had not, but I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Isn't that interesting? Paul saw Paul, yeah. Discipled by the Lord himself for three years, and he prioritizes to go see Peter and James. And then we continue the larger narrative, which brings us back to the monumental conversion of Cornelius. But this brief visit by Paul to only two men, Peter and James, before Cornelius' conversion is among the reasons that I see James' distinction in role and service becoming more and more clear, and why therefore it would be a natural conclusion to see him engaging in this next great chapter in the church too, when Cornelius' conversion happens. That's why I think he was there. I think that's why he was participating, because he's clearly in a significant role of leadership, which soon gets us, it sets us up for the most significant events of the early church as recorded in Acts 15. But we have another seemingly incidental moment in Acts chapter 12 that again highlights the distinction of James not only um, uh, among not only other believers, but the leadership of the early church. And this moment came when James, the son of Zebedee, was murdered by Herod. So the other James, the James, James the son of Zebedee, the um, James, the son of thunder, was murdered by Herod. Then what happens, Herod says, hey, that went over really well with the popular group. Peter's also arrested, but then he's supernaturally set free by an angel in the middle of the night. Peter's like, is this a vision? Is this real? It was real. And many of you probably remember the story how Peter himself thought he was having that vision at first, soon realized that, no, it was indeed, he was indeed being freed from being incarcerated by an, um, by an angel. He gets to John Mark's house. We like those little details, don't we? John Mark's mother's house. Remember John Mark? We like to highlight those details. He goes to his mom's house where believers were gathered and surprises everyone. They at first said, no, it's not Peter. It's maybe an angel. And what do we see happens here? We pick up with Acts chapter 12, verses 16 and 17. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him and were astounded. But motioning to them with his hands to be silent, he recounted to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison. And he said, what? Report these things to James and the brothers. Then he left and went to another place. I would ask, did you catch that? But I kind of went, James. So I hope you did catch it. <laughs> Go tell James. Isn't that interesting? James, the son of Zebedee, has been murdered. Peter, the apostle, has been incarcerated, supernaturally set free. He goes, tells the others, and they're all excited. He says, go tell James. This is important update of church leadership matters. And he didn't have to qualify which of the several persons named James either. They knew James the just, James the righteous. Now skip ahead to Acts 15, where we come to the church's first council, which came as a direct result of the missionary work of Paul and Barnabas, who the Holy Spirit sent out from the church in Antioch. We see a parallel in um, Galatians 1, 11, and 12. I have that for you. And to properly appreciate this moment's context, we need to recall once more that before Paul's being sent out, um, actually, yeah, he first came to salvific faith and was personally discipled by Christ. That's where he testified in Galatians 1, 11, 12. He states, For I make known to you, brothers, that the gospel which I am proclaiming is good news is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's why I'm saying he was 
supernaturally discipled by the Lord himself in that period of three years. So he's already qualified that. That's who has discipled and evangelized and discipled Gentiles. They're coming to faith. That's his credentials. Now, keeping with the timeline in Galatians for a moment, we note that Paul next provided a record of the Jerusalem visit that we've already referenced where he came to see James and Peter, or Peter and James. That was Galatians, um, where I go to see these two men. Now we're going to advance to Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. So we're fast-tracking a little bit, but we're following Paul's testimony in tandem with Acts. Don't worry, we're centered on James. But I want you to see these connections. So he fast-tracked his testimony for the purposes of engagement with the Galatians and stated that after 14 years, this is a long period of time. We read Acts, we're like day after day after day. No, this is, since we're getting a lot of history here. He went again up to Jerusalem and met with those who are pillars of Christ's church for a very specific purpose to affirm the integrity of his gospel, a message to the Gentiles, a matter of paramount importance. And I want you to see Paul saying, I'm confirming my theological testimony to the Gentiles. And whom does he go to? The pillars of the church, whom he consulted James, the brother of Jesus, Peter, and John. And what was the occasion of this engagement? It was as we've established the Jerusalem Council were following Peter's charge to the group. James went on to provide the matter's final resolution. In this, he secured the affirmation of the shared body, the apostles, the elders, and the whole of the church. Major pivot, major theology here. And who's right here at the, at the, the tip of the spear? It's James. A moment clearly and authoritatively referenced to by Paul in his engagement of the Galatians regarding the matter of faith and works. You know, you think about Galatians, what is he talking about? He talks a lot about faith and works. And people get so caught up on, oh, James. He's writing Galatians and he refers to the theology that was affirmed by James. A context that not only has the highest esteem for James and does not only does not want to take issues with theology already well established in the letter of James. The letter of James is already out there. And here's right in Galatians, of all places, if he was going to correct James, this would have been the place, but rather he says, you know what, I went to James and he affirmed my theology. And for that matter, not once in either men's public ministry do we have record of James and Paul crossing swords. Rather, we have Paul securing James's affirmation of the integrity of the message he declared to others. Because Peter, Paul, and James are in theological concert with one another, and it was not because they were capitulating to some squishy middle ground. Hey, let's just find something we can get along with, or you write your letters, I'll write mine, and it works out. And they weren't valuing one another in morbid ways or simply unaware of one another's body of doctrine. No, it was because they were faithful, they faithfully declared the gospel and the body of doctrine it produces with faithfulness. Now, I want to pause at this moment and act for a little longer because there's some additional matters that we would do well to highlight from James's involvement with the Jerusalem Council, which we'll come back to. But I want you to remember some things from the Jerusalem Council. We're going to read it, so it's a little bit backwards, but you'll follow. Don't worry. So here we have the Jerusalem Council. What is James doing? And how does that connect us to the letter of James? How does that help us understand things? Well, first, he uses like language and writing style in both this small letter here within Acts and in the letter he sent to the Jewish believers abroad, which contributes to the body of evidence that it was James the Just who wrote the epistles, the same author. You might think, well, that's a tiny little letter. It was sufficient to hear tone and vocabulary and style, and it was similar of a like nature to how he wrote in his epistle, different than other people. Some examples of this, I know they're not the greatest, they're not the most comprehensive, but some, some examples include his greetings in James chapter 1 and, act, and also in Acts 15.23, um, and the language of the name by which believers have been called, which is structured differently in these two texts, but are the same in the Greek, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, Acts 15.17, and the good name by which you have been called, James 2.7. Second, James expresses a pastoral sensitivity. This is very important. He is a pastor, and he exercises a pastoral sensitivity to the believing Jewish community. He knew that this would undoubtedly be a difficult transition, and indeed it was. And again, we get so caught up. Why is it so hard? We weren't there with thousands of years of history or even almost a decade of church history. This was a hard change, and James pastorally cared for the flock. So he gave supplemental instructions so as to reduce unnecessary offenses to Jewish believers. Third, James clearly demonstrates that he was a respected authority within the church as a whole. He effectively gave the final word. He says, in my judgment, and then they said, yep, that's good. So he gave the final word on this monumental matter, and it was his letter that went out as such to the larger church as well, which brings us back to his own letter. One simply addresses as coming from James. James. 
Because this is the kind of person who could write and be received with an authority that did not require unique or heavy qualifications or titles, a matter that we also saw in Jude being able to secure a proper measure of authority in his own letter by simply referring to his own identity as James's brother. The authority was strong enough. It could carry even over to Jude himself. So the consequential nature of this event in Acts chapter 15 and James's leadership and its role um, and its resolution helps us date his epistle as one would naturally come to the conclusion that, like Paul, he at the minimal would have made some form of reference to this occasion in his own letter, or Gentiles for that matter, unless it was written before this time of the Jerusalem Council. So that helps us date it as well. So we have his leadership, we have his pastoral care, and we have some dating and uh, material, or some understanding of the material of his letter, and why he did and didn't include certain things. Now, one final observation from regarding James's role in the early church comes in Acts chapter 21. And because of the nature of what happens here in Acts chapter 21, we tend to fast track it and say, oh, this gets Paul arrested. So we kind of get there. Well, there's a reason. There's something happening here to include some of the uh, larger thematic elements that it introduces uh, in the book of James. There's certain things that when we get to the book of James, we're like, why did he say that? Why did he talk about the law that way? Am I comfortable with that? Well, there's a historical context, and you understand what was his frame of mind regarding the law and Christian theology and the church. You get a peek at that in Acts chapter 21. So because of that, we're going to read a little bit more. But first, I think we should read the full account of the Jerusalem Council just to kind of prime us for Acts 21. So 15 helps you understand 21. 21 helps you better understand the book. So let's walk through this real quickly. And again, as we read Acts 15 and then Acts 21, it's important, please be mindful, that in the, the very different context, James is balancing the distinctions of the church as one body consisting of Jews and Gentiles. He's balancing that with the Jewish believer's affection for the law. And that wasn't a bad thing. He's saying the church is Jew and Gentile, but that there are Jews who are properly and acceptably zealous and affectionate for the law. A matter of tension that we are experientially unfamiliar with now. We don't feel that tension, but theologically we should be very aware of it through the present, especially as we work through James' treatment of the law and his writing to Jewish Christians. Not mixed, it was Jewish Christians only at that time. And we do this mindful that our context is in some ways so tremendously different. It's very different, I know that. But the balance of the church now being effectively a Gentile church with many Jewish believers doesn't change the value of that letter and how we should understand law and the scriptures and the current New Testament church. And again, how it worked itself out in history and church history through the instruction provided through James, it didn't just fade into the archives. It could have just been something that, you know, it worked itself out. We don't need to worry about it. It was preserved in a letter. And because it's been preserved for us, we need to give it attention as well. So with all such matters in view, We'll read from Acts chapter 15 now, and having already provided a measure of commentary for it, we're just going to immediately go to Acts 21, but I want you to see them together. So again, reading both while being mindful of the church's struggle to better grasp its relationship with the law and the unification of a new body consisting of both Jews and Gentiles under the leadership of men such as James and Paul. So here we have Acts chapter 15, verses 1 to 32. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That was imperative to Jewish theology, so we, we understand that. And when Paul and Barnabas had not a, a little dissension and debate with them, the brothers determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. So Paul and Barnabas had been or evangelizing and discipling Gentiles who were not being circumcised. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, recounting in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and were bringing great joy to all the brothers. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Make them Jewish proselytes so that they can become Christians or believing Jews in this context. But the apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And after there had been, no, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of, God, word of the gospel and believe. What's he referring back to? 
Cornelius. Who else was there? James, I think. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit. Remember, that was a really big deal. Just like we received the Holy Spirit, so did they. And he made no distinction between us and them. No distinction. They don't have to keep the law. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe, the leadership of the church, that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. Same thing, justification by faith. And all the multitude kept silent. And they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders um, God had done through them among the Gentiles. Now, after they had stopped speaking, who speaks up? James, James the brother of Jesus, James the just, answered saying, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon related how God first concerned, concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. So he, what does James do? He loves to go to the Old Testament. Guess what he's going to do all throughout the book of James? He's going to go to the Old Testament. After these things, I will return and I will rebuild the fallen booth of David and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, I judge that we do not trouble these, those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from sexual morality and from what is strangled and from blood. Why? Because we don't want to produce unnecessary offense to Jewish believers. For from ancient generations, Moses has um, from ancient generations Moses has those who preach him in every city, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them, Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they sent this letter by them, the apostles and the brothers who are elders to the brothers in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia who are from the Gentiles. Greetings, since we have heard that some of us, or that some of us to whom we gave no instruction, no authority, have gone out and disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls. It seemed good to us, having come to one accord to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we have sent Judas and Silas, and they themselves will report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from the things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from sexual immorality, from which if you keep, you keep yourselves, you will do well. Farewell. Sincerely, James. James who? James the brother of Jesus, James the just. So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter, and when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And both Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with a lengthy message. I love the ending to that. I hope you're encouraged by that as well. <laughs> and now we fast forward to Acts chapter 21, verses 15 to 26. And here we read, now, after these days, this is a significant time afterwards, after these days, we got ready and started on our way up to Jerusalem. This is a Luke sharing about his journeys with Paul here. And some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, take, uh, taking us up to Manson, uh, Minson of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And after we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us gladly. And the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. Hmm engaging James again by name. And after he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God did among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. And they are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you, that you are teaching all the, all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then is to be done? Point of tension again. Point of struggle. The Jewish believers are struggling with some of the allegations against Paul going to the Gentiles and impacting Jews. They will certainly hear that you have come. Therefore do this, that we will, uh, what we will tell you. We have four men who are under a vow, 
This is under a Jewish law vow. Take them and purify the Nazarite vow. Purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Then all will know that there is nothing to the things which have, been to which have been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. But concerning the Gentiles who have believed, we wrote, have de having decided that they should keep from meat, sacrifice to idols, and from blood, and from what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. Reference back to the Jerusalem Council letter. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice of the completion of the days of purification, until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. Paul enters the temple. He prepares himself, cleanses himself, participates in sacrifice. Not a problem. Now, we've already given attention to Acts 15. I said I wasn't going to provide any more commentary. I did, so I'll try not to do it now. But note the following details here in Acts chapter 21. First, Paul makes a prioritized visit to Jerusalem. And who does he meet with? James and all the elders. But note, we have one person named here, just James. Second, when the Jerusalem believers and leadership hear of Paul's work among the Gentiles, they glorified God. They are rejoicing. Their worshipful joy and their response to the news of the Gentiles coming to faith in Christ. Gentiles as Gentiles and not Jewish proselytes. So we don't need to muddle that up and get confused. Third, there was an affirmation of the natural tension of this season of the church, a tension exasperated by some and, ju and just wrestled through by others. And this tension expressed itself here as faithful, believing Jews who were zealous for the law, who could read like we do in the Psalms, oh, how I love your law. And they're not saying, well, that means something. They, I love your law. They were hearing rumors that Paul was undermining the law among other believing Jews. Fourth, there was a plan to demonstrate among the believing Jews that Paul does indeed honor the law. I would say a plan that Jew, uh, James spearheaded, at least he was complicit in helping put together. Fifth, there's a reiteration of the commitment not to impose the law on Gentiles, but to direct them in such a way as to not unnecessarily offend the Jews. Sixth and final here, Paul chose to honor the proposed plan, demonstrating his honoring of the law. Now, these matters can be challenging. It can be hard for us. What's happening? How do we reconcile that with other things by Paul? But what is clear is that James was in a position of distinguished leadership among the believing Jewish community, and neither he nor other faithful believers imposed the law on believing Gentiles. However, both James and many of the believing Jews had a continued affection for the law and therefore continued in various practices accordingly, a matter that Paul had no problem in honoring when he was also among them. Okay, that's our walk through Gospels and Acts. And that's going to conclude our development of the person and leader of James. And as I stated early in our time today, my introduction to James is a little bit more exhaustive than other books of a like size. So if you're visiting, don't worry. Don't, don't be like, boy, I'm glad I'm not here when 1 Corinthians. I mean, like 16 chapters proportionately, the introduction. I didn't even finish working through the first word here of the first verse of the first chapter of the book. We still have some more things to say about James next week, but we'll, we'll be more efficient about it. But I'm okay with that, because I'm not sure where else would you properly cultivate an appreciation for this letter's author. Because as extraordinarily important as he is, his highlights are almost um, incidental inclusion into larger narratives. Even in Acts, where it's so plain that both Peter and Paul have a high regard for him, the book itself does not give him a concentrated moment of attention outside of his role in the Jerusalem Council. I remember even watching a church history class, and they're talking about this and this and this, and I'm like, but James, where's James? And it's because, well, Luke emphasizes Peter and then Paul, and that's okay. But I want you to see James's role and his, his consequential role, because he's there, and he was faithfully participating in the shepherding care of Christ's church. So I hope as we advance into a more traditional introduction next week, you'll hear and appreciate James differently. Because all that history impacted how he wrote and what he said. So when we talk about themes, you're going to help you have some aha and oh yeah moments in view of what we've talked about. I hope that the tone, the themes, and even the structure will be more clearly valuable to you after having walked with James, the person today. James the brother of Jesus, otherwise known as James the Just or James the Righteous, and by way of tradition, even known as Camel Knees.
because he was reported to have calloused his knees from long hours of contact with the ground as he labored in prayer. He prayed so much he's had calloused knees and he was nicknamed Camel Knees. And as we now prepare to close in prayer ourselves, I want to give you just a few takeaway items. First, I know as we talked about in Jude, um, like his brother Jude, James lost many years that he could have walked with Jesus. And I can imagine that was a measure of burden for him. I mean, I grew up in his home. I was right there. I had access to him. And I persisted in unbelief. But his theology would prevail, and he'd recognize the Lord is good, and he's sovereign, and he, what a kindness that he drew me to himself when he did. And I got to see the resurrected Lord. But he wasn't a believing disciple. Not until after the resurrection, and the Lord restored that which was lost in abundance. And I share that because some of you and many others carry the burden of a, a later salvation. And I hope you'll continue to see these precious examples of the years of usefulness that can still come even when your conversion is later than others. That's okay. That's what the Lord designed. That's what he had for you. None of us, though, will ascend to the heights of James. We're not going to be leaders in the early New Testament church, and that's okay too. But kingdom faithfulness does not require that of us. Just be faithful. Second, while coming to faith later than others, James did not have one of the most weighty and consequential roles. Uh, excuse me, while coming to faith later than others, James did have one of the most weighty and consequential roles in the early church history. And yet it's all but overlooked. And I think he would be just fine with that. I don't think he'd be like, whoa, guys, you know, I reviewed this history thing and um, I appreciate you remembering me every so often. I think he'd be fine with that. He was not fretting about his place in the credits, but was clearly concerned with something. And I hope you did see this. I hope you saw over and over again, what did James emphasize? It was pastoral care for the newly constituted church as it learned its way, to including the path of walking in wisdom from above that might be that they might be perfect, that they might be fully mature. That's what he's aiming at in his letter. A pastoral concern for the foundations of the early church that they would walk in wisdom from above to perfect their faith in righteous works and deeds and words. So for us, we would do well to pursue a like audience as James did, not concerned about the credits, but an audience of one walking and serving before the Lord, concerned not with being uniquely highlighted by others, but faithful slaves of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. Third and finally, for a variety of reasons, the book of James is often an, um, an underappreciated book. And I don't think that he would be disappointed about his, his esteem by name, but I think he'd be very disappointed by the book and letter's lack of esteem. I think that would be very disappointing to him. He would be grieved that so many fail to see the value of a spirit-inspired letter that is packed with expectant action. It's like 50 imperatives in like 100 plus verses. He's action-packed, if that's what you want to direct us to walk in the wisdom from above that our faith and its accompanying works again might be perfected that we might be mature and complete while we patiently wait on the Lord's return. I think if he knew that that got missed, yes, he would be very disappointed. We're going to do better. We're going to labor in James and we're going to struggle with things. We're not going to trip over silly things like, well, he didn't say this. Well, of course he didn't. He wasn't Paul. But you know what? Paul really respected James. He doesn't sound like Peter, but don't worry. Peter said, go tell James. I like the guy. I respect the guy. Let James speak for himself and yield and hear what he has to say. So with that, I hope to encourage us all to do better because James's letter has such an extraordinary, much material to offer for us, much good to have in terms of the wisdom of the Scripture, the wisdom that comes from, from above. All right, that will conclude our first, verse, our first word of the first verse of the first chapter. Um, I'd encourage you in preparation next week, read and read and read James because when we come to the structure it's going to take some work, but it's really clear. And I think what you're going to see is that, wow, not only that clear, there was somewhere he was going, and I want to know that because I want to go with him. So we're going to walk through that, some major themes and light material next week. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for James. When we think about what kind of mixed emotions and thoughts he must have carried. Um, perhaps maybe people did come to look at him and say, is that what Jesus looked like? And that'd be kind of annoying, but at the same time thinking, yeah, I was that close to him. But to be reminded that the resurrected Christ encountered him. The resurrected Christ opened his eyes and transformed him. And he wasn't Jesus' brother anymore. Now he was the slave of, of the Lord God, and, and or he was the slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was 
infinitely more valuable than being also another child of Mary. So we thank you for his unique role. We thank you that he fought through very challenging <laughs> chapters in church history, chapters that we romanticize and we sometimes we forget. It's like uh, pioneers moving out west and we think, oh, isn't that fascinating? And we, we don't even like the bugs when we have a picnic. There's a lot of hard things that he worked through. And he led your church, and so we're so grateful. And we're grateful for how you shaped him through that and how you crafted a magnificent letter through those experiences and through the encouragement that he provided. I thank you that he was a master student of the Old Testament. I thank you that he was a master student of, of his Lord's teachings in the New Testament. I thank you that you've preserved it for us. I thank you also for his participation in the Jerusalem Council. What a kindness. So Lord, help us not to make much of James, to honor James, but through James to make much of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.